Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our discussion with Wendell Potter, who was an insurance executive, private insurance executive, and became a whistleblower on the private insurance industry. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit how you got to be a whistleblower. And uh, so tell us a little bit about growing up. Uh, uh, you know, what were the kind of, what was the political culture of your household? Did you believe in the American dream and the mythology of uh, uh, sort of the flag and patriotism? Uh, what, what was the culture and politics of your house? Well, it was. It was that. I grew up in one of the most Republican uh, parts of the country, historically Republican, uh, East Tennessee, uh, which is, I don't think uh, my congressional district has ever been represented by a Democrat, the first congressional district of Tennessee. Uh, we were raised uh, poor. Uh, my, my parents uh, didn't have a lot of money. Neither of them was able to go to college. My dad was a farmer uh, initially, and they operated a little country store, and that wasn't doing, that wasn't doing too well. They were losing money, so dad took a job at a factory uh, several miles away in Kingsport, Tennessee, that's where I grew up. Uh, we were working, you know, certainly a working class family. And uh, I don't know that I even knew a Democrat for uh, much of my life. You were uh, born in 1951. I was born in 1951. Right. I think there's like one month between us. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I uh, and yes, yeah, certainly we were, we were patriots. My dad had served uh, in World War II. Uh, he, um, uh, in fact, I wear my dad's dog tags uh, to this day as a, to honor my dad. Uh, he didn't talk a lot about the war, uh, but we were certainly patriotic folks. And uh, it's interesting. I kept my dad's dog tags for a long time. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, dog. Somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why do poor people in Tennessee vote Republican? It actually goes back to the Civil War uh, because that part of Tennessee. Uh, did not want to secede from the Union. Uh, it was, there, were, there were a lot of Union, I referred to them as Union sympathizers, but there were uh, a lot of folks who joined the Union Army from that part of Tennessee. It's very different. Tennessee is really, uh, it's often referred to as uh, the three states of Tennessee, the three grand divisions. There's East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, and West Tennessee. And East Tennessee has been Republican for, for as long as I guess anyone can remember. And uh, so it's it's cultural. It's uh, your report. You're, you, you're born into. It's kind of like being born into the Republican faith to a certain extent. But it's changed. That faith has dramatically changed from back even when you were. It has changed. The party has changed. It's uh, the Republican Party that that I grew up in and that uh, I was familiar with. It's it's unrecognizable now. But like the party of the Civil War, the party of yeah. uh, Lincoln. Yeah, um, you know that's a whole nother world from the party of you know uh, George Wallace and the other. It, it's true, but for for a lot of those folks, George it's Wallace was a Republican, right? Yeah, he he was, he was a, Democrat, a Democrat, but he, did was he a Democrat. became a Republican. Do well, there Wallace Democrats? Yeah, and yeah. Most of these Wallace Democrats Dixie became Democrats, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, in in fact, there were a lot of uh, uh, Democrats in Middle and West Tennessee that. Uh, have over the years certainly become Republicans, and that's why Tennessee now is a very red state. But uh, uh, in East Tennessee, they, it's uh, you're just kind of born into it, like you're born into um, the Baptist Church, for example. It's just part of your identity. And even though the policies have changed, uh, uh, people still feel that they need to be a Republican. So I mean, at uh, least since the, the 50s and 60s. Um, well, certainly during FDR in the 30s, yeah. um, one would have thought poor people would have identified more with the, the FDR Democrats and even yeah. what came later, certainly in comparison to Republicans. Right. In fact, my dad, and I'm probably here because of FDR's uh, social programs uh, that were labeled as socialism back in the day. Uh, one was the, uh, the CCC, the, uh, the uh, Conservative Conservation Corps, I think I'm getting that right. Uh, which was one of the first uh, programs that that Roosevelt implemented to uh, tra to get uh, young men at that time uh, trained to do some and and to work on public uh, and w public works. And my dad actually went all the way across the country to serve uh, 
uh, or to work in Washington State, uh, mm -hmm. developing a, a, a national park or a state park out there. And then later, when he came back, he uh, was hired by the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was another um, Roosevelt. All quote unquote socialist supposed programs. Exactly. And but he's still in the faith, the Republican faith. Yeah, yeah. They, they always, to my knowledge, continue to vote uh, Republican. I'm named after Wendell Wilkie, uh, you know, a Republican uh, from uh, before I was born. But uh, uh, that just shows you how Republican my family, family was. And, and even though my dad uh, was, got those jobs and, and, and the training that, that uh, he got from those jobs was uh, invaluable, uh, they, they, uh, they I, I don't think I ever saw, uh, like I said, I'm not, not even sure I even met a Democrat until I was almost in college. So you grow up believing and this patriotism, the America, I call, you call the religion a republicanism, but I right. call the religion Americanism. Mm -hmm. um, you grow up with that. Uh, when does it start dawning on you that you start questioning all of this? You know, in college, uh, I was the uh, the first in my family to go to college. Uh, I began to be exposed to other other people and other. And other, this is uh, during the Vietnam War. It was during the Vietnam War. It was, and I, uh, uh, while I was at the University of Tennessee, uh, I uh, got involved in the student newspaper. I ultimately was uh, uh, able to serve as pres excuse me as editor of the student newspaper. Uh, was involved in. Uh, politics a little bit on campus. Uh, so I got, I wouldn't say radicalized, but I certainly was exposed to other, other thinking and certainly to a lot of people who came on campus during the Vietnam era. Uh, uh, William Kunstler and some, and some, uh, some people. Who was a very the, famous civil rights lawyer. Exactly, yeah. An anti-war lawyer. Right, and, exactly. Uh, so I began to be exposed to other thoughts and uh, other ways of thinking. And uh, that began to you know, open my, my, my mind to, uh, to see the world a bit differently than when I Well, the deciding thing about that era was the war, Vietnam it was. War. You know, your stance towards it had a lot to do with what you did with the rest of your life. Yeah. And, um, and while I was there, by the way, uh, uh, Richard Nixon was president. And uh, right after uh, the bombing of Cambodia, uh, uh, Billy Graham was holding a crusade on the University of Tennessee campus at Nayland Stadium, the football stadium, uh, and he invited uh, Richard Nixon, or Nixon invited himself to come to this crusade, and uh, I went to that uh, to see what was going on. Uh, Nixon and Billy Graham uh, on stage in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, and there were a lot of uh, students who were protesting that, and some of them were friends of mine and got arrested. Uh, so it was quite quite the time. And how did you feel towards it? Uh, I. Uh, I became very anti-war myself, and uh, as I became editor of the student newspaper, I, I wrote some editorials, certainly, that were uh, anti-war. And did, did this put you at odds with your parents? Uh, not necessarily, because my dad, as, we, as I noted, he had been in the war, mm -hmm. uh, he, and I was, I'm an only child. Uh, he did not want me to have to go to battle. Uh, to, go, to go to war, uh, he, it was uh, the memories of of war were just too vivid for him. He lived through it, and uh, I think he would have um, uh, wanted me to go to Canada uh, rather mm -hmm. than really uh, than mm -hmm. for me to go to uh, to serve in Vietnam. Uh, as it happened, uh, you know, we had that lottery. We had a lottery back then uh, when the draft uh, changed, and and you were subjected to the draft based on your lottery number. I had a high lottery number, and um, so I didn't have to serve. Mm. Uh, but I, my dad was, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, that was one thing, that he certainly disagreed with, uh, uh, with others in the party about the, the, the value of war. When you say you weren't radicalized, but you're writing editorials against the Vietnam War in yeah. Tennessee, I mean, that's kind of radical, isn't it? Well, I guess you would say that. Maybe, maybe so. Maybe you, Tennessee is one of the states that gives rise to a lot of soldiers, isn't it? Oh, it has. That's why it's called the volunteer state. Uh, has historically, and uh, probably still to this day, has. Uh, and and one reason why it still is today because a lot of soldiers come from poor communities and poor families. 
uh, and uh, that's just. Uh, uh, but there still is this uh, volunteer spirit. The, uh, the University of Tennessee uh, is—they're called the, the volunteers. So it's it's it's, it's historic, uh, and and is and it still is. Uh, people I think feel that way, and um, a lot of uh, God and country in Tennessee to this day. So, I'm guessing when you say you weren't radicalized in a sense that. You were against the war in Vietnam, but that didn't cause you to question some of the underpinnings of America, how things are run, who owns stuff, what the politics is made of, or did it? Not so much, not so much. Although uh, I really wanted to be a journalist, and I, uh, I majored in journalism. I just fell in love with the idea of being a journalist, and, uh, and I uh, was able to get a good job after I graduated from the university at a, a sizable metropolitan paper in Memphis. So I moved to Memphis and... Uh, are, you, are you voting Republican or Democrat at this point? Uh, Democrat. So you, uh, bro you broke the faith. I that. broke the faith. In fact, I think the first vote that I cast was for George McGovern. Oh, um, well, you really so, broke the faith. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> I did. So I, by that time, I, I certainly had, uh, had, had changed my, uh, my, uh, my political outlook. and. Uh, I think, it, again, it's partly because of the war, uh, and I think uh, there's no, no denying that. But. Now, your father may have not wanted you to go to war, but you voting McGovern is past, you know, in terms of liberal or progressive values. Right. How's your father with what's becoming of you? You know, I, I, I felt uh, that I needed to... We didn't have... A lot of political conversations, to, to be honest, uh, uh, and I, I think I'd, that was maybe just out of respect for my my parents and their point of view. We didn't have arguments at the at the dinner table. Um, um, some years later, I actually went to work for a, a Democrat, a guy who was running for governor of Tennessee, and uh, uh, we did have some conversations then. And I think I think actually that might have been the first Democrat that my mom and dad ever voted for. It was the guy that I was working for as press secretary mm -hmm. some, some years ago, several years ago. So you become a journalist. Yeah. What, what kind of journalism? What are you looking at? I uh, was a general assignment reporter initially. I uh, was on the police beat for a little while, but I soon uh, uh, began to get assignments to cover local politics in Memphis and uh, cover the city council in Memphis. And, and then I got uh, lucky. I got noticed and was asked to uh, go, was, was assigned to, to cover state government uh, in Nashville. So I was a state house reporter for, for a while, uh, covering the governor's office, the state legislature. And then after a couple of years of doing that, I uh, got noticed once again and uh, was uh, given a chance to go to Washington. And I was a newspaper reporter uh, in the Scripps Howard newspaper uh, chains bureau in Washington. It was back when Scripps Howard own a lot of newspapers. What year are we in now? Uh, this was in the mid-70s. I, uh, uh, that's when I went to Washington. It was during the last part of the Ford administration and the beginning of the Carter, Carter administration. The more you see inside the workings of politics, yeah. what does that do to the way you view the world? Yeah, I get very cynical at a very young age. Uh, and this was back during the time when there was such a thing as bipartisanship in, in Washington. Um, uh, but I, I, I got pretty cynical when I actually saw how Congress uh, really works up close and personal uh, to, to see that. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I frankly decided I didn't want to uh, to grow old as a reporter in, in Washington. I, I would go sometimes to the National Press Club. I was a member there. And I would see these uh, old uh, reporters, uh, probably my age now, but uh, at the time they seemed ancient. And they were always at the press club bar getting loaded uh, after work. And I thought, that's not, that's not the way I want my life to turn out. By more cynical, you mean you started to see the way money controlled the politics? I did. I did. And I saw the reporters becoming cynical uh, observing it and uh, just making them cynics. Yeah, I always thought it was very similar. I, I made a movie once about professional wrestling, mm. uh, which is uh, it's called Hitman Heart Wrestling with Shadows. It became fairly well known. Right. But it's, you would have the theater of wrestling and then the real business behind the scenes. And there's a whole media and press 
that covers the theater, at least it used to, yeah. as if it was real. Right. And I always thought that's how a lot of the press corps covers Washington. Oh, it is to this day. And it's uh, one of the reasons I, 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 I've written the books that I have written because of the, the insufficient quality uh, of, of journalism out of Washington. The, almost all the reporting that you see, in my view, is very superficial. It's almost as if they're sports reporters covering uh, uh, politics as if it were a sporting event. It's exactly how it's done. And uh, there's very little reporting about policy issues. Uh, 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 and when I was a reporter there, that was back before uh, money was as influential as it is now. And there were far, far fewer lobbyists in Washington during that time. Um, but they certainly run the town now. So you get cynical about the whole system. Mm -hmm. And that cynicism, I guess for a lot of people, leads one to the conclusion, well, you might as well make some money. Well, that's exactly what I ultimately decided to do. Uh, and my way uh, out of journalism at that time, my first uh, uh, venture into uh, the world of uh, um, politics, if you will, and, and then later business, uh, was to serve as a, a, a press secretary to a guy who was running for governor. Uh, I, he lost. Uh, he, he won the uh, Democratic nomination, but he lost the general election. And he asked me to stay on to work with him. Uh, he turned out he was uh, from Knoxville. And Knoxville, he was leading a, a group of local folks who were trying to bring a World's Fair to Knoxville, Tennessee. And I thought that was kind of silly. Uh, but he asked me if I'd stay on and, and, and help him pull that off, and I did. And uh, we did. Uh, Knoxville had a World's Fair in 1982. Um, and I went from uh, there to uh, uh, Atlanta uh, and uh, was a partner in a small PR firm. And, and then from there into healthcare. Uh, so uh, I was making more money, um, certainly more money than, than most journalists make. And by the time that I uh, got recruited to one of the big health insurance companies, I thought I had it made. Mm. So what do you do with this kind of, this being who had gotten somewhat radicalized and sort of progressive and you yeah. saw uh, the, you know, the, the role of money and corruption in politics and, and such, what do you do with that person as you get more and more in the corporate world and start, yeah. what, to embody, I guess, the values of yeah. where you're working? Yeah. I tried to bury that, that, that guy. Uh, from you know my earlier years, I uh, was uh, pretty happy making more money and uh, getting promotions and and having jobs with uh, important sounding uh, you know important sounding titles. Uh, and it's very hard to walk away from that. Uh, it really is. But I uh, I was pretty impressed with myself and and the money bought a nice house and a couple cars and. And uh, we were able to establish a, a lifestyle that uh, uh, a lot of people would envy. Certainly one that I couldn't imagine when I was growing up in East Tennessee. Uh, I was making more money uh, probably in the year that my dad would make in 10 years, if not more. Yeah, you were making what well, something close to in today's dollars would have been close to $500,000 a year yeah. when you left. Right, exactly. Well, uh, the story of being so successful and making a lot of money and leaving it, blowing it all off, uh, is going to be the subject of our next segment. So please join us for the next segment of Reality Asserts Itself with Wendell Potter on The Real News Network.